I was recently left a voicemail from a number I didn't recognize. Now it's not unusual, it happens every day, no matter what you say. In fact, these days with automated pharmacy calls, political canvassers, marketing firms, and just genuine scams, the phone is starting to feel more and more like a dying form of communication. Why would I bother answering from an unknown number when it's just going to be a robot, or someone calling to tell me about my car's extended warranty? My car is just fine. There's a thriving communications market with companies like Snapchat, Facebook, WhatsApp, WeChat, and many others competing with one another in the pursuit of a common goal, making AT&T look like a clown. These forms of communication compromise by cutting down on the contact from scammers and political interest groups who can just purchase your phone number from a data broker anyway. Despite how annoying an unwarranted phone call can be, every now and then, there's a special treat that is left for you in your voicemail. Sometimes your best friend leaves you a drunk message at 2 in the morning, or you have a saved message from a loved one who passed on. Sometimes it's just a pocket dial, or, you know, one of the weird sounds of a busy office. Sometimes it's even more weird, though, just like a message I received the other day. Now, personally, I like to look up the area codes of the random numbers that call me or leave me a voice message. It's fun to see if you can guess where a call is coming from, but to be honest, it's pretty difficult. I'm gonna flash a few on the screen and see if you can recognize any. The number that left me my special message was from area code 440, the greater suburbs of Cleveland, Ohio. Now take a look at this map of the Ohio area codes. You can see that area code 440 is squeezed in the middle and ultimately made discontiguous. But why would anybody do that? As it turns out, area code 440 was created in 1997 during a two-part fragmentation of area code 216 following the creation of area code 330 one year earlier in 1996. Area code 216 was one of the original 86 area codes, covering a region spanning the entirety of the rapidly expanding Cleveland metropolitan area. A report published in 1994 concluded that the city would run out of available numbers for area code 216 by the end of the year 1996. This was just a recognized limitation of the original North American numbering plan. In 1947, the American Telephone and Telegraph Company, better known as AT&T, created a nationwide numbering system for all North American telephones following the end of World War II. Back in those days, telephones involved switchboards and operators, making long-distance calling a particular nightmare, involving relay nonsense across overlapping operator networks. God forbid you were in New York and you needed to contact a loved one in Seattle, or a business partner in San Francisco. Originally, it designated 86 unique three-digit codes, 77 for the United States and only 9 for Canada, but growing urban population density quickly necessitated a further expansion. This standardization offered a systematic way for local telephone service providers to expand the amount of unique telephone numbers that could operate in a given area. Before area codes were introduced, the telephone dial plans across the existing phone networks in America just varied. Luckily, the seven-digit plan quickly became the most popular, prompting it to be selected as the foundation to the ten-digit plan that the North American Number Plan adopted. Seven-digit phone numbers are still used today, actually. If you only dial seven numbers, your phone is just going to assume it was a local call and automatically input the area code for you. If the first three digits mean something, do any of the other ones? Well, yes, actually. Usually, North American telephone numbers are composed of three fixed-length fields, the area code, the central office code, and the specific telephone number. Even though 10-digit plans became standard, long-distance calling still required the use of tolls, switchboards, and operators, creating a desire for greater efficiency. The introduction of area codes allowed central office codes to be reused on a regional basis, greatly contributing to the development of direct distance dialing, which was first used successfully in 1951. You may notice that you share a central office code with a family member if you are on the same phone plan. This is because a service provider will use the same central office code for all the numbers they issue, up to 10,000 per store. This is a tightly controlled system that often goes underappreciated. Phone numbers are not as chaotic and random as they seem. They're carefully ordered to help incorporate geographic information without compromising the anonymity of the telephone owner. The North American Number Plan Administrator website is where service providers such as Verizon and Sprint need to go every time they try to open a new location in the stupid mall. 
There is some neat information on there, such as this spreadsheet of recently terminated central office codes, or this web page, which allows you to look up the central office codes of a given area code. Here's a fun fact for free. Both the largest and smallest US state have only one area code each. There are several states in which the borders of one area code wrap around in what I'm calling Pac-Man code-like patterns, or PC for short. There are examples of Pac-Man codes in Arkansas, Georgia, Indiana, Missouri, Ohio, and Wisconsin, but none are quite as sickening as the one in Ohio for reasons I'll get into later. There are also some places where one area code totally surrounds another, like in Utah, Pennsylvania, Kansas, and Arizona. But Utah takes the cake. Only two area code boundaries defined in the whole state and one completely surrounds the other? It sort of makes you wonder why some service providers draw their boundaries so differently. Was there some sort of massive antitrust lawsuit that systematically destroyed and privatized the business of the telephone administration system? In 1982, the fragmentation of the Bell system was mandated, which was the birth of long-distance service providers known as Bell Babies, who took over the administrative role AT&T used to play. For most places in America, that fragmentation of Big Bell meant regional service providers took over. However, somehow the state of Connecticut and the city of Cincinnati were left unaffected? Southern New England Telecom became the exclusive long-distance service provider for Connecticut, but it was founded only a couple years before the Bell system dissolved. When AT&T was forced to withdraw their majority shares, SNET was able to become the only service provider covering Connecticut. It ultimately didn't matter because just 30 years later in 2006, the company was simply refolded back into AT&T. Even more strange, Cincinnati residents were treated to having a service provider exclusive to their city known as Cincinnati Bell. Cincinnati Bell was successful on its own, having developed the exclusive rights to provide telegraph service three years before the telephone was even invented. Cincinnati Bell and SNET were the only two Bell babies that operated independently due to AT&T Corporation only owning plurality shares. Then, um, in 2018, Cincinnati Bell acquired Hawaii Telecom, making them the exclusive telephone service provider in Hawaii for, um, reasons. You know, Hawaii Telecom has a messed up history all its own that I'm not going to get into, but just look at this screenshot from Wikipedia. They were bought and restructured by the Carlyle Group and then run by Stephen F. Cooper, the man who took over Enron after the scandal broke. Speaking of islands, Bermuda and several Caribbean nations were included in the NANP due to Mommy England begging to have her big red line on the map. This means a small island with less than 100,000 people received an area code designation five years before an attempt was even considered for Mexico. It's important to note real quick that these attempts to incorporate Mexico into the NANP ultimately failed, leading to the withdrawal of the three area codes Mexico did have, and the decision to adopt an international country code. This means that there is only a single Spanish-speaking country in the NANP. The Dominican Republic. When it comes to islands in the Caribbean, somehow the only two divided islands are both involved with the NANP. The French side of St. Martin and the Haitian side of Hispaniola both elected to be lame, which makes sense considering their relationship to the French. The smallest area code by population is 664, a small British colonial territory, Montserrat, which doesn't even crack 5,000 people. The smallest area code by geographic area is a bit of a contested subject, actually. See, Chicago's 312 is puny, but look at California's 213. Also pretty small. Wait. 312213. Did they do that on purpose? It's so strange how various cities choose to divide up their area codes. Most of the infrastructure was laid a century ago, so for the most part cities have evolved around where the telephone lines are, and not the other way around. Looking at some of the horrible area code maps in downtown areas, you can see the consequences of this. You already have seen LA and Chicago, but look at some of these too. And finally, Cleveland, Ohio. Area code 216 and 440 share a uniquely strange border. This is Bedford Reservation. Area code 216 wraps up and into Bedford Reservation through the woods, chooses to divide off a random assortment of houses, and then snakes along this creek here. 
This makes 440 particularly hideous, and also one of the few discontiguous area codes in the United States. There are, I think, two more? It's hard to tell. Arizona, I don't know what you're doing. Florida, I really don't know what you are doing. Bedford, Ohio was an early attempt at an Indian reservation in the year 1795. Okay, just kidding. I didn't forget about the voicemail. 440 was the area code of the number that called me. Have you noticed the quiet background music in this video? Well, it sounds bad on purpose. You've actually been listening to the voicemail I was left this entire time. It was a voicemail, three minutes long, that played a one minute and 28 second loop of generic call room music. And instead of just deleting the message and moving on with my life, I decided to spend hours researching area codes and the North American numbering plan.